Capacitor Simulation Example. The purpose of this video is to compare a simple closed form analysis of a parallel plate capacitor to a more rigorous simulation of it that takes into account all the fringing fields and stuff and looking at the difference between the two and maybe figuring out when our simple closed form analysis would break down. So first we'll perform the simple closed form analysis. Well, we won't perform it, we'll just report the answer and then we'll calculate the capacitance of the example capacitor. After that, I'll step you through how a numerical analysis would be performed to calculate more rigorously the capacitance of some device. Then we'll compare the two at the end. Closed form analysis of a parallel plate capacitor. We don't need to step through the whole derivation of this. We've already done that. But the result for a parallel plate capacitor is that the capacitance is the permittivity, and we're writing that here as the product of the free space permittivity times the dielectric constant. So it's the permittivity times the cross-sectional area divided by the gap. So if we have a capacitor with more area, we get more capacitance. If we separate those plates by greater distance, we get less capacitance. That's because there's a less intense electric field, and so we store less energy in that dielectric. For easy numbers, let's say these plates are one meter by one meter and separated by one meter of air. It turns out the capacitance is around 8.9 picofarads. Well, spoiler alert, if we were to do this numerically, we calculate close to 19 picofarads. So we're off by a factor of two. Why the big difference between these two? It's the fringing fields. There's actually energy outside of the area immediately between the plates. And this has to be accounted for because that contributes to capacitance. So the more rigorous capacitance is actually higher than what our analytical capacitance would calculate because our analytical is only looking at a perfectly uniform field immediately between the plate. And what you'll see is it's neither completely uniform nor inside the plates. Numerical analysis of a parallel plate capacitor. I have no expectations you're going to come away from this with a, as an expert on how to do this numerically, but I just want to give you a taste of how it is done. So to use this code that I've written, the first thing I'll do is define an array where I build the device, in this case, a capacitor. And what you'll see is there's a line here representing the top plate. There's a line here representing the bottom plate, and there could be some dielectric in between. And so I have a big array, maybe it's 200 by 200 points, and I'm assigning values to each point in that ray so that if I plotted the array, I would see a picture of the device. Once I have that and I've developed a numerical algorithm, we'll get more into the details, but I want to solve this equation for the electric potential V. And when I do that, this is the answer that I would get. And I can see the high potential on the top plate that I put at a half volt, the low potential on the bottom plate that I put at minus five volts, and you can see the potential everywhere in between. Once I know the electric potential, I can calculate the negative gradient and then calculate the electric field. So between the plates, you know, it is relatively uniform, but you'll notice it is definitely not uniform. If you look at the field near the edges, but still between the plate, these fields are not completely vertical from plate to plate. They're starting to fringe already. And then of course we have all of this fringing field outside of the plates that our closed form analysis would completely ignore. So the picture here is different than what we've assumed for our simple closed form analysis. And that's very typical. Um, the more rigorous you make your closed form analysis to account for all that stuff, the more complicated it becomes and it gets to the point where it's, it's really not even worth it if it could even be solved. Once we know the electric field intensity, then we can calculate the electric flux density simply by multiplying the electric field by the permittivity. Once we have that, 
then we can calculate D dot E at every point in our array and then add all of that up. And that would be the total energy stored in that capacitor. And this can account for energy stored outside of the capacitor. Once we know that total energy, we divide that by the applied voltage squared. And the applied voltage here is one. And in a simulation, I always tend to do one. So really it's just two times W. And when we do this, we get around 19 picofarads. Let's get a little bit more into how this works. It turns out I feed my codes two different arrays. So on your mind, you can imagine them superimposed. But on the left here is the dielectric constant at every point outside the capacitor and inside the capacitor. So here you see there's a medium with a dielectric constant of two and then there's air outside. Then I have an array, instead of saying yes or no to being metals or not metal, I put in a zero for nothing, but I'll put in a positive 0.5 where I'll force those to a 0.5 volts and a negative 0.5 where I force those to negative 0.5 volts. And I won't do anything with where it's zero. So I'm not forcing the electric potential to zero where there's zeros here. That just means I'm not doing anything. If it's not zero, that's where I'm forcing it. So I feed my code two different arrays, and those are very easy to draw. Now from there, we would like to solve Laplace's equation. And so we're just looking at the cross section of this device. So I just need an X and Y, it's a two dimensional analysis. So here's the scalar Laplacian decomposed and just X and Y components of that. X and Y coordinates is what I mean to say. Now I'm going to approximate each of these second order derivatives using something called a finite difference approximation because I am storing my electric potential in an array. So I just have the electric potential known at discrete points, but I'm still able to estimate a derivative. And so we don't need to go too much into that, but these are finite differences and it's a, essentially a weighted sum of all of the local electric potentials. And this equation enforces Laplace's equation. I can factor it into a slightly different form. And it turns out this makes it a little bit easier to put into an array or to think about it. But this equation has to be written once for every point in the array. So if my array has 200 by 200 points, that is a total of 40,000 points. I will be writing that equation 40,000 times. Well, of course I won't physically write that, but in principle, they're there. We put this large set of 40,000 equations into the form of a matrix equation. And it has this form. We have a big square matrix L, pre-multiplying a column vector V equals another column vector of all zeros. So in this column vector V are all of the electric potentials throughout the entire two-dimensional grid. We have the square matrix L, which is essentially calculating a numerical Laplacian of this electric potential, although we're not using it that way because we don't know the electric potential. But if we did, and we pre-multiplied by L, the answer we'd get wouldn't be zeros, but it would be the Laplacian. But right now it's set all equal to zeros because that's the equation that we did the finite difference approximation of. And just for kicks and giggles, if we wanted to see what this matrix looks like, I'm showing that over here. These orange regions, these are all zeros and there's numbers kind of going down the, the center of the matrix here. This is called a diagonal matrix. Uh, in fact, it's a probably a tri-diagonal matrix or I don't know how many diagonals there are, but this is very typical for what matrices look like in numerical methods. Now, unfortunately, I can't solve this yet. If I try to solve this equation for V, essentially bring L over to the other side, so I have V equals L inverse times zero, well, anything multiplying a column vector of zero, it just gives me a column vector of zero. So it's a trivial answer. But the reason I can't find the solution is because I have not yet told this problem what where I'm holding the potentials. Remember, there's that plus 0.5 on the top and this minus 0.5 on the bottom. I haven't told that matrix equation that information yet. So that's the next step. I look at my matrix equation and anywhere there's a row through this corresponding to a point on the grid 
that is force to some potential. So this particular point along this top thing might be along this row. I will zero out that entire row. So in other words, uh, the row of L, I am throwing out the entire finite difference equation. I'll put a, a one in the diagonal position. So if the row were farther up, I would be inserting that one farther over to the left. And if that row were farther down, I'd be inserting a row a little farther over to the right. So I put all zeros in, put a one in the diagonal position, and then over here in the column vector, I will put in the number that I'm forcing that point to. And I'll do that for every single point where there's a forced potential, where I know the potential, and I don't touch the zeros. Now we have a solvable form, V equals L inverse B, and B is this column vector where I've put in my force potentials. Once I get this, I have a column vector, and I want to reshape that back to a two-dimensional array, and when I plot that, I get the electric potential around these plates, and I can look at that and say, yeah, that makes intuitive sense. I have high potential at the top, low potential at the bottom, and along any little path, it varies essentially linearly. So at this point, I have the electric potential. I can calculate the electric field intensity by the negative gradient, and I can make a nice plot like this of what the electric field looks like throughout that capacitor inside and outside. Once I have the electric field intensity, I can calculate the electric flux density by multiplying by the permittivity. Now this dielectric constant is one of the arrays that I built. So I have a point by point multiplication happening here. So my D, my electric flux will change also as a function of position across the grid. Now I wanna to calculate total stored energy, which I can do one of two ways. Since I know D and E now, I could just calculate their dot product and add them all up all the way across the entire array. Or maybe I don't even wanna calculate D. I could just do a point by point multiplication of the dielectric constant with the magnitude of the electric field squared and add all of that up to also get total energy stored in that capacitor. Once I have total energy stored, well, from circuit theory, we know that the energy stored in a capacitor is one half CV squared. And the V is just our applied voltage, V naught squared. In this analysis, we put the top plate at positive 0.5 the bottom plate at negative 0.5, so it's one volt applied. And that's very typical for what I do when I excite something. I always excite it with things that have a magnitude of one. Anyway, uh, I can bring this expression down here and I have a nice equation for calculating the distributed capacitance, but the reality is um, I will add everything up first to get total energy and then just calculate capacitance with this equation here. Two times the total energy divided by the applied voltage squared. Let's compare the results that I get. I already saw, at least for this one meter by one meter with a one meter gap that I'm off by a factor of two, but let's look at some trends. So in the upper left, this is the simulation where I have one meter across and one meter separation. And we saw there's a 50% error or 100% error, depending which direction you're looking at that. So 50% error. Now, as I go thinner, Notice that the field is becoming more intense and the fringing fields are just less area. And so the error goes down. When we're actually making a parallel plate capacitor to be a capacitor, generally we go through extreme measures to make sure that that film is as thin as possible in order to get the capacitance as high as possible. And so another benefit of having this as thin and wide as possible is that our simple parallel plate equation becomes very, very accurate. So it only becomes unaccurate when the separation is relatively large and the fringing fields has a, a good portion of energy outside the capacitor that the closed form analysis would ignore. One more trend, what if we increase the dielectric constant? So we start with air, then we go up to two, and we go up to five, but otherwise the capacitor remains the same. And what we see is that the dielectric constant, as that go up, the fraction of error goes down. Now, why is that? That's because when we put a higher dielectric constant between the plates, 
the field, the energy prefers to be in the higher dielectric constant medium. So as we increase that permittivity, the energy of the field moves into that. So there's just a higher fraction of energy between the plates, which is something that we're capturing in the closed form analysis.